Hello everyone. A very happy evening to the all the children present here. So yes, I welcome you all towards the day four of uh, refresher course. So today's session is about the biology that you have studied in your school. And today's topic is process of recombinant DNA technology. And to take today's session, we have uh, with us Dr. Dalia Vishnudasan. She is an assistant professor in the department of uh, uh, Biotechnology in the School of Biotechnology, which is at uh, Amritapuri. So I'm really happy to welcome ma'am towards today's session. And uh, yes, she is having a lot of experience and uh, she is really into research and all of that. She has been awarded PhD in the area of plant molecular biology from Delhi University. And she has worked as research scientist in the Department of Primary Industries at uh, Australia. Her interested areas are plant biotechnology and plant tissue culture. So I welcome you, ma'am, towards today's session. And uh, today's session is going to be really excited one for you because they have arranged their lab and everything for you to understand the concept deep in details. And yes, you could see someone else in the screen. So uh, she is Ajisha, um, her st uh, student, Dalia ma'am's student. So yes, I hope it's going to be a very exciting session to all of you. So thank you so much children for joining and I think more people will join soon. Yes, ma'am, I think we can start today's session. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining. Okay, so let's get started. So we have our chapter, chapter 11. So we are going to talk about, you know, the principles and processes that go into our biotechnology. So your book that I'm going to refer to, your uh, CBSE book, so it starts with, you know, uh, something very interesting. We're looking at um, anthropocentric. Uh, so we have anthropocentric viewpoint about life, right? So everything is centered around us humans. So according to Rene Descartes, a French philosopher, we try to explain and understand everything from the viewpoint of just one creature, which is us humans. But uh, life is more than that. But anyway, let's stick to what we have learned today. So to start with, we have two very important people. Uh, we have uh, Herbert Boyer and we have Stanley Cohen. So Herbert Boyer and Stanley Cohen, let's look at what their contribution was towards my technology. So uh, Herbert Boyer, when he was working at uh, Yale University and all, uh, he figured out that uh, there are these, uh, you know, enzymes. So bacteria, your E. coli is a bacteria. So this E. coli bacteria, how does a bacteria look like? Uh, if you were to just, you know, look over here, I have a petri dish out here. And uh, petri dish, you can see. There are some small colonies out here. Can you see some small colonies? So each of these are bacterial colonies. And uh, if I take just one bacterial colony from here, it will have you know billions of bacteria. So they're all going growing in a petri dish, and they provided a media in this petri dish for the bacteria to grow. So we've done some nice good quadrant streaking on a petri dish. So these bacteria, these are recombinant bacteria. They have not it's just not the E. coli bacteria. But the bacteria has something within it, which is known as a plasmid. Now, there comes the contribution of Stanley Cohen. Stanley Cohen had isolated plasmids from this particular, let's say, these kind of bacteria or E. coli. And uh, Stanley Cohen and uh, Herbert Boyer, when they got together, what they did was they took a plasmid and uh, they digested the plasmid using restriction enzyme. Now, what are these restriction enzymes? Uh, I have Arisha with me who will show you what these restriction enzymes are. So we have a restriction enzyme in P out here. I hope you can read that. And this in three enzyme you can use for, so these are cutters basically. So in biotechnology, what do we do? We basically make use of uh, restriction enzymes and ligase enzymes to, you know, cut the DNA of our interest. And uh, then we ligate them and put it back into the bacteria. What does the bacteria now do? Well, the bacteria starts utilizing this particular gene, which is your DNA, your gene of interest, and starts producing the thing which is of interest to you. So biotechnology is all about, you know, applying natural products or anything derived from nature 
for the application and benefit of humankind. So that's what the definition out here also goes ahead in your next uh, page. So we have two pioneers, Herbert Boyer and Stanley Cohen. And they got together somewhere in uh, a place, Hawaii, to you know, think of this idea of actually cutting and pasting DNA in order to make something called as recombinant DNA. So biotechnology, what is biotechnology? It deals with the use of live organisms or enzymes which are derived from the organisms to produce stuff which is important for humans. That's what is the very basic definition of biotechnology. So what's the difference between biotechnology and genetic engineering? Well, genetic engineering is just a toolbox that we use within biotechnology. So think of, I say there are tools like restoration enzymes, which you can use. And we have pasting enzymes, the ligases. So these enzymes, which uh, Ajisha just showcased right now, they are available in the market. And where did we get them from? We got it from the bacteria itself. Nowadays, we have companies providing it to us. So we make use of these bacterial enzymes and uh, use that for our biotechnological applications. Now, what are the applications? In your textbook, people are, uh, you know, cited a lot of these examples, and these examples are very important. So let's look at, you know, some of these in vitro fertilization techniques. Again, they don't use any genetic engineering, but nevertheless, uh, it is applicable to humans, and therefore, even in vitro fertilization, which is, you know, in vitro means done within a class. So you're fertilizing within and uh, a tube or glass, and then you get test tube babies. Or uh, the new definition that as per the European Federation of Biotechnology is, uh, about biotechnology is, it's an integration of natural sciences and organisms, or even cells, or it could be part of the cell. For what? for molecular analogs, for products and services which are of benefit to humankind. Humankind, again, doesn't mean just us humans. It could be applicable to veterinary or any other sciences also. Okay, so genetic engineering. What is genetic engineering? It's a toolbox within biotechnology. So just like you have tools to do anything, we have genetic engineering as a toolbox. And within genetic engineering, you have these different enzymes and whatever stuff to make use of. To undertake your biotechnological application. So these are techniques to alter your genetic material. Now genetic material could be DNA, could be RNA. Okay, viruses, some RNA viruses and all, you're looking at genetic material. Now, why do we do all this? Well, because we want to make things which are of importance to us. For example, we have antibiotics, we have vaccines, we have enzymes. All these are very important and if we can, you know, expedite the process of, you know, treating humans, human diseases, or it could be even veterinary diseases. If we could, uh, you know, look at uh, new antibiotics, uh, which are capable of withstanding. Right now, we have, you know, having this problem of AMR resistance. Uh, bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics. So if we could develop newer antibiotics, which can, you know, overcome and address those challenges. Or in uh, right now, post-COVID, we know that vaccines are very important. And uh, we are in the process of, you know, developing vaccine, not just for COVID, but any, let's say, new emerging diseases, zoonotic diseases, we need to be ready. And uh, enzymes, where we use enzymes, enzymes can be utilized in any biotechnological applications. Now, what is this recombinant DNA? Recombinant DNA is when you take a DNA, which is naturally present, and you cut and paste it into a vector. Now, what is a vector and what is a plasmid? If you look at the bacteria, each of these bacterial cells called names will be having a plasmid within it. What is a plasmid? A plasmid looks something like, so you can see something, uh, you know, whitish at the bottom of my centrifuge tube. So that is, if I were to just, you know, click it, you would see that it is starting to, you know, mix. Okay, you can see strands of DNA. So these strands of DNA are very important. The whitish whitish flecks that you're seeing floating around in that solution, those are your DNA, plasma DNA. Now, this DNA, what do we do? We can digest it with enzymes. So we have restriction enzymes, like uh, out here, we have our HIN3 enzyme, right? So we have HIN3 enzyme, 
and we have our buffer. So these two things come together. So we have the enzyme and we have the buffer. Now this enzyme and the buffer when we use, then they work together. We cannot use an enzyme without a buffer and they have to be compatible enough. So we make use of the technology, so-called recombinant DNA, wherein you take the DNA from nature and I put it into a bacteria in a plasmid. And now this plasmid is readily usable and I can put it back into my E. coli bacteria in order to make the, let's say, the product which is of importance to me. So that is what is all about recombinant DNA. And then we have these terms, gene cloning and gene transfer. What is gene cloning and gene transfer? So I'm cutting the gene, putting it into a plasmid. So let's say I have a plasmid out here. Now this particular plasmid, let's say, what is plasmid? Well, think of these two rubber bands that I'm having in my hand. Plasmids are basically made of two single-stranded DNAs. When they come together, it becomes a double-stranded DNA. Now this double-stranded DNA is all what your plasmid is about. It's very small, size is very small. Uh, in your textbook, they talk about PBR322. Now this plasmid, if I take any gene, if I cut it, so let's say I cut my plasmid. So the plasmid is now, let's say, the double-stranded DNA. I cut it and I put another gene out here in this region. Now, this plasmid goes back again into my bacteria and now I can utilize that for a number of applications. Now, so we have few more definitions. Origin of replication. So what is origin of replication? Going back to my plasmid, rubber bands right here back again. Now this plasmid DNA will have certain region. So let's say some of these regions, I open this up, okay? So that will become my origin of replication. So depending on the origin of replication, how fast it opens up. If it opens up very fast, this plasmid DNA is going to multiply very rapidly. So we have origin of replication that is responsible for initiating replication, the multiplication of our DNA. So if I have a plasmid which doesn't have this ORI sequence that opens up pretty fast and multiplies, helps in multiplication, then I call it as a low copy plasmid. So we have plasmids, low copy plasmids, which do not multiply so rapidly. And therefore within one bacteria, you may not have so many bacteria, so many plasmids. Normally within just one bacteria, you may have a lot of plasmids. But normally what we have in our bacteria, so in a bacteria, what do we have? All of these plasmids. So it's think of billions of, you know, bacteria and each of these bacteria having all of these plasmids within it. Because why? Because the origin of replication is so good and nice that it multiplies very rapidly. You have a high copy plasmid. Now, so we are looking at a native plasmid. What is a native plasmid? There are a lot of these plasmids that exist in nature. That is a native plasmid. Now, what do I do? I can take that native plasmid and remember, we talked about uh, Stanley Cohen and uh, Herbert Boyer. What did they do? They accomplished this way back in 1970. What did they do? They took an antibiotic resistant gene and they cut it out, inserted it into this plasmid, which was isolated from Salmonella typhimurid. And what did they get? They got oh, the very first recombinant DNA. So what are restriction enzymes? These are molecular scissors. You make use of these scissors to cut your DNA. So once you cut your DNA, so let's say this is my plasmid DNA. So if my plasmid DNA is there, I'm going to cut it. Now what do I get? I get overlines. Okay. So this is my plasmid DNA. I just cut it with my restriction enzyme. Just as you. Now what do I call it as? Now I call this the original native plasmid as a vector. So what's the difference between plasmid DNA and a vector? Plasmid DNA is something which exists in nature. So we can think of uh, TI plasmid. If you have studied that in your class 12, TI plasmid exists in agrobacteria. This is present in nature. And if I take that plasmid, I cut and paste genes which are of interest to me. Now what do I call it as? I call it as a vector. So that's the difference between a plasmid and a vector. Now I transfer pieces of DNA attached to it of this vector. I can put it back into my bacteria or I can put it back into my agrobacteria or whatever. And then I can go ahead with my RDNA processes. So 
So what are the basic steps if I want to do genetically modify an organism? Identify the DNA, first and foremost thing. What is the DNA? Which gene am I interested in? So I should be very clear about, okay, the gene that I want to insert is, let's say, if I'm doing uh, genetic engineering for crops, and in your, I think in the next chapter, you have uh, PT cotton and PT brinjal, all those examples, or even your golden rice. What do I do? First, I have to look at the right DNA. So if I'm interested in golden rice, what will I do? I'll take the beta carotene genes and those desirable genes, I will introduce into my host. What is my host? Well, since I'm doing modification of plants, I have to put it in a plant. It's not that easy to put in a plant. So first I put it in a bacteria. From the bacteria, I isolate the plasmid. And then from the plasmid, I isolate the gene of interest and I can go for biolistics, which is bombarding the genes into the plant. So once I get introduced the DNA into the host, so the genes have been, you know, biolistically introduced into my host, let's say plant. And then what do I do? I have to maintain that host plant and make sure that I get the next progeny. Transfer of DNA is happening to the next generation. Only then I call it as a stable transgenic plant. So that's how I do basic steps in modifying an organism. So I talked about modification of a plant. You could do modification of a bacteria. You could do modification of any organism. These are the basic steps involved. Identify the gene which is of interest to you. Then you introduce that gene into your host. Often the host could be a plant or could be a micro, but it's better you first start with microorganism, put it in a you know plasmid, easy to replicate, and then you take out the gene again back, and then you do biolistics. That's the way you do it for genetically modifying your plants. So what are the tools in our toolkit? We have restriction enzymes. What are restriction enzymes? Well, we call them as restriction endonucleases. They are restricting the growth of your bacteriophage in E. coli. So E. coli is a bacterium. And what is this bacteriophage? Nothing but viruses. So they're much smaller than your bacteria. And when they were isolated way back, so we have, you know, way back in 1963, they isolated this particular restriction enzymes. And there is a particular way in which it is named. So we have, you know, HIN2. We don't have HIN2, but we have HIN3 out here. So what is this HIN2 and HIN3? So, okay, I hope it works. So we have HIN3 out here. And in your book, it's HIN2. What's the difference? Well, and how do we give nomenclature? Well, the first, let's say they've given with example, you know, ECOR1. ECOR1 comes from E. coli, the bacteria, which we've been talking about. And the R is derived from the strain. So we have eco R1, RY13. So E. coli is the bacteria. So we have the genus and the species name. Genus is Escherichia. Then we have coli, which is your species name. You combine it both, you know, E from Escherichia, CO from coli, and R1 is your R and the strain that you're looking to. Okay. So that's how you give name to your bacteria. Now, where is this one coming? Well, now you have your, remember, each time people are isolating new enzymes. So we have HIN2 and HIN3 out here. So HIN2 was isolated first, then came in HIN3 from the same organism. So you keep on giving, you know, new nomenclature. It's being isolated from the same bacteria. So why do, uh, let's say, bacteria have this kind of a restriction endonucleases? In order to evade this pathogen infestation, let's say E. coli is getting invaded by this particular virus, bacterial patch. So it has to kill the patch, otherwise it's going to take it. So that's why they have these restriction endonucleases, which are very specific. As soon as they identify this particular, you know, stuff gene coming in, they will identify and start chewing it. So that is the arsenal that bacteria have developed over the years. How many Restriction enzyme, let's say your book says we know about at least close to 900 restriction enzymes from 230 different strains of bacteria. So that's a huge number. In a lab setting, we may not have so many, you know, restriction enzymes, but definitely we do have, let's say, a few enzymes that we can easily work with. Okay, 
So how are they classified? Restoration enzymes are classified as exonucleases and endonucleases. What are exonucleases? They remove nucleotides from the end of the DNA. Whereas endonucleases, they cut within the DNA. So where within the DNA? There's something known as palindromic sequences. So palindromic sequences, again, your textbook talks about what are palindromes? Let's say this is a palindrome, the word Malayalam. What does it mean? If you write it in this way or you write it and read it in this way, it's the same. So both, whether you read forward or backward, the word is the same. In the same way, if you read this particular sequence, forward or backward, it remains the same. Now, this is the site for ECOR1 restoration enzyme digestion. Easy to remember if you remember just the first three words. So we have G, A, A. Just remember this. And then it's a mirror image. So you put A, opposite to A will be your T, opposite to this A is again your T, opposite to G is your C. So if you remember G, A, A, that is more than enough to remember the sequence for ECO R1. Where does this enzyme now cut? In between this G and A, you see this arrow, that is where ECO R1 is going to cut. And at the bottom strand again, between this G and the A, a cut is being made. So what do you have? You have two overhangs. So these are the two overhangs, sticky ends. So this is the overhang out here and the strand out here is also having two overhangs. If you want to ligate them back, the two overhangs can ligate. Okay. So it's very specific. You cannot take any other cut portion of the DNA and try to ligate it. So it's not that easy to you know, stick things along. You can, how do you want to ligate it? You can use another enzyme to stick the portions of your DNA. We call it as ligases. Now, going further. So these are our strands. We have 5 prime, 3 per mn, the same sequence, GA. GA is for equivalent. Where does it cut? Cuts between this G and A, in the top strand. And cuts between this G and A, in the bottom strand. 5 prime, 3 prime, and here is 3 prime, 5 prime. So these restriction enzymes, now you're taking your plasmid DNA. So this is your plasmid DNA. And in your textbook, they're talking about PVR 322. Take your foreign DNA, any D gene which is of interest to you, and you cut it with your equal. And equal one is cutting, let's say, one, two, and three fragments it has made. And one of these fragments is of interest to you. You can ligate it into your plasmid. So you're going to use ligases. Ligases are tasting enzymes. Cutting enzymes, tasting enzymes. That's all what you need. So once you've ligated, you see that, okay, there is this sequence which has gone and inserted. So the gene is there. What do you do with this plasmid? You put that plasmid back into your E. coli, the bacteria. So once it is back into your bacteria, this bacteria is going to multiply. When it multiplies, all this recombinant plasmid is going to multiply number of times. Remember we talked about copy number. The low copy number, the high copy number, these mostly are high copy number because of origin of replication. So think of this E. coli and having a lot of these plasmids within it. And each time the E. coli is multiplying, it's making millions of copies. So this particular petri dish might be having, even if you were to just look at, you know, one bacteria out here, it might have billions of bacteria. And each of these bacteria will have all of these plasmids within it. Now we can isolate some of those plasmids. Now, again, when you see it further, how do you do this isolation? If you want to look at plasmids, you have to do something known as you know, quantifying the plasmid, doing gel electrophoresis. You can separate and isolate the DNA plasmids. So if I were to just showcase to you, we just have a crude method to showcase how plasmid DNA might be running on a agarose gel electrophoresis. So think of this, you know, agros gel electrophoresis. I'll just show you in a minute. But before that, let me just uh, showcase to you how things might run in a agros gel. So we have, so we have, uh, so you can see on the top. So these are where our wells are, and at the well, the first one is meant for marker. So you run the marker out here. So you can see a lot of these fragments, DNA fragments. And then I've loaded, let's say, in this particular gel, a DNA plasmid. And then what do I do when I run it? There is this marker out here. And just above the marker, you would find your genomic DNA. And where does the plasmid run? 
So you can see the plasmid is running out here. This is your supercoil form of your plasmid. And by looking at the marker, you can identify the size of your plasmid DNA provided. The plasmid DNA is you know, digested, then both the strands of DNA will get cut. If the plasmid DNA is intact, let's say what will happen. Now remember plasmid DNA is having always double standard DNA. When it moves, it's going to move from the top of my cell, move all the way down. And when it moves all the way down, what do I get? I get this super coil form of DNA. And this super coil form of DNA is running above the RNA. RNA is always at the bottom of my gel. So that's the normal plasmid. It moves, you know, it's super coil, highly condensed form of plasmid. And that's the way I would see, you know, a gross gel. What about there are other conformations of my plasmid? So I've been very, you know, uh, let's say not very good in doing DNA and isolation. And what do I get? I get one plasmid, which is, you know, one of the strands is broken. So one strand is broken. Now, this is a NIC DNA. Where will it run? It will run above this, you know, super coil is going to run at the bottom. So that's my super coil running at the bottom. And then I have the NIC one, which is running at the top. If I break both the strands of DNA, then I will be able to identify the size of the DNA based on. So if it's going to run at a particular size, I can say, oh, that's the size of my plasmid DNA. But just by running the normal plasmid, the supercoiled one always runs faster. So you cannot identify the size of the plasmid DNA just by running into another rosier. You can only identify the plasmid if it is cut on both the strands. If one of the strands, what I'm showing over here, it's one of the strands, it's going to run above it, okay, further above. And that is not an indication of the size of my DNA. Last my DNA. So keep that in mind. That was Ajisha helping me out. Okay, so that's what is this. So we have marker. The smallest one, well, let's say I have digested my plasmid DNA and there are small fragments. The small fragments will be at the bottom. Now, without digestion, even the big supercoil plasmid will run further down. Okay, so that's something which you have to keep in mind. The largest fragments will be running at the top. And uh, mostly in plasmid DNA isolation, I would have, you know, genomic DNA as a contact. What is genomic DNA? Bacteria has its own genome. It has its plasmid DNA also. So those are two different things. So if I take a plant and I isolate the DNA, what will I get? I will get genomic DNA, lots of genomic DNA. So just like you have bacteria having a lot of genomic DNA, plants also have genomic DNA. And those genomic DNA will be running very high up in the chair. And then at the bottom, I'll also see a lot of this RNA, which is present in the, let's say, the organism. Now, how do I see all these DNA? I will see all this DNA if I'm using a gel electrophoresis unit and I run something like, a, you know, I will cast a gel so I can show that to you. When I cast a gel and I run it, how does it look like? So this gel out here, is, you know, so showcase to you how it looks like. So we have the setup over here, and you can see that there is a, a unit that is running, you know, the electricity is being supplied and it is running at 100 volt. Now, when I run it, again, remember there are two electrodes the positive and the negative electrode. DNA being negative always runs towards the positive electrode. So this red wire is what is important. So I have this electrophoresis unit out here. And uh, what do I have? I have something known as, you know, combs. These are combs. And the combs are there in a unit where it, a gross gel would be casted. And these combs are the places where I can load my DNA. So if I remove the Combs, there will be holes in the gel. How does a gel look like? To show that, I'll just get back over here. Uh, ma'am, just a suggestion, ma'am. You can stop the screen sharing because there mm -hmm. is somebody typing in the chat. Uh, I have just highlighted your video, but still, you can just stop sharing. So I think your video will be, I have already highlighted it. Your video will be showing in the full screen. So if you're just removing the screen sharing. Uh, are you able to see what I'm trying to showcase? Uh, 
please close the screen, ma'am. There is a screen share option. Okay, you want me to disclose that? Ha, disclose, yeah, if that is done, then this video will be highlighted more. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Okay, so now we we'll just uh, okay, we'll get it back over here. So we just showcased uh, the electrophoresis unit. Now, is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's completely okay. fine. Okay, so we have the electrophoresis unit and it is running and you can see it's at 100 volt. The positive and the negative electrodes are there. DNA always runs towards the positive electrode. So we have the positive electrode connected over here and the gel is out here, let's assume, in this particular tank. The tank has a buffer. It's not just plain water. So the buffer is your 1x PAE buffer, which is the buffer that we use for running our DNA. So normally we have this 1x PAE buffer. The PAE buffer is normally kept in, you know, made in, kept in a shop by your bottles. And once you make these, yeah, TAE buffers, you pour it into your tank. This gel electrophoresis unit tank runs pretty well. Right now it's running and you can see some bubbles and all. And uh, that's because the bubbles are coming. And once your DNA has been loaded into you know, these kind of cells, um, so assuming that you would see you know these kind of cells down in the gel. So what does a gel look like? Well, this is what a gel would look like. Okay, if I take it into a, you know, take it out, the gel looks like this, and you can see some of these, uh, you know, wells. That's where you load your DNA. So you can see empty wells. Right? This is where you load your DNA, and in one of the lanes, you would load your marker. So you have marker, let's say, in one of the lanes, and the other marker is over here, and you loaded DNA in the gel. So if I were to just uh, switch off and showcase to you, so this is a UV. So I will just showcase to you how it looks like when you switch on the UV. And uh, you can see the UV is switched on. And what do you see? So you see some, can you see some, you know, orange glowing kind of bands? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We are able to. Yeah. Those are your DNA samples. So you can see some of these bands and you can see the lines that I drew in pencil before. You can see some of those lines. And the plasmid DNA is another band that you can see, which is, you know, very densely uh, just uh, visible okay, near the marker. So that's how your DNA gel looks like, plasmid looks like in real situation. Okay, then we have something uh, called as the PCR. So... Uh, let me showcase that PCR machine. I think ideally that will be good before we get back to our screen sharing. So PCR machine looks uh, something like, uh, okay. so are you able to see the PCR machine? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, is uh, the cycles and all visible? No, ma'am. That is actually, there is actually light and so we are not able to view. So much of a light? Yes. Okay, we'll just try to see if we can switch on the lights. Okay. If we switch on the lights, can you yes, see Yes, yes, yes. They are able to see. Huh, okay. Yes. Okay. So what are we trying to see over here? This is a PCR cycle. And the PCR cycle is like, uh, so we have, you know, 95 degrees. We have, is this visible if I'm trying to showcase? Mm. I think actually the laptop is just moving. I think the camera is just moving. So that's why. Yes, we could like see it. something written. Yeah. Okay. So PCR uh, works. Uh, if I get it. Much, yes, yes, yes. Then, it's yeah, completely fine. Just, okay. Ah. So what do we see out here? We have uh, 95 degrees. We have, you know, that's the cycle. So we start with the denaturation step out here. Then we have the primer binding step. Then we have the extension step that is 72. So this is what a PCR cycle is all about. Goes from step, so we have step two, three, and four, which get repeated. So it gets repeated at least 34 times written out here. So we can set up something like PCR in order to amplify the plasmid DNA, which is a, the gene of interest, which is there in the plasmid DNA. So PCR cycles are, you know, so this machine is a PCR machine, and we have, you know, cycles within the PCR, which you can 
keep you know change it if you want so if i want to change uh, this 30 seconds to let's say i want to keep it for let's say a minute i can do that so i press and now it's for a minute and i press okay and then it goes for at least a minute so that's how i go about uh, you know doing changes to my so now it has been changed to a minute so this is how i set up my pco 95 denaturation followed by another step wherein denaturation happens again so initial denaturation followed by the step wise denaturation primer binding and then i have the extension step so these are the main steps which are involved denaturation annealing of the primer out here and then 72 degrees which is where your tac polymerase is going to come and extend your dna and then this cycle gets repeated 35 times so 34 plus one cycle okay so once it gets done at the end of the time what do you get you get let's say amplified dna and the volume is very important so we put around very little amount let's say 25 to 50 microliters of my sample in my pcr tube so my pcr tubes are very small tubes uh, i'll just show what the pcr tube looks like so these are small tubes and these small tubes uh, if you can again see these are very small tubes clear transparent ones so they're very small and what do i do i just get it i open my so i open my so that's my machine i open it i keep my sample the pcr thing so around 30 microliters of my sample is there i keep it back and never you know touch out here it is very hot and i close it and then i can run my pcr from here once i do that i get billions of copies of dna now these billions of copies of dna what do i do with them i can like i said i can take that dna i can do biolistics put it into my plants my plants will now then become a hoping to put it into an you know x plant and I'll get more transgenic plants out of that export. And that is what is your transgenic technology, GM crops and all, all that. Okay, so let me get back to my uh, screen sharing mode. I think it's still on. Uh, no, ma'am, the screen is not visible. You can just try to share it again. Okay, I tried doing that again. Screen share. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. I think not the chapter. Yes, yeah. yes. Now it's fine. Okay. So let's get started with. Okay, so we, yeah. So we are now looking at PCR analysis. Uh, okay. Let me get to PCR and come back to cloning again. Okay. Since we talked about PCR. DNA, I've shown you what the DNA looks like. It's a pretty nice, good. Uh, you know. So just like. What is shown over there in your textbook, we have DNA out here in an append of, and you can see the whitish thing. If I just, you know, turn it a bit here and there, you can see cloudy thing. That is your DNA. So it could be genomic, it could be plasmid DNA. Right now it's plasmid DNA in this append. So I make use of this DNA. I can do PCR setups. Uh, gen we as genetic engineers, we do a lot of this digestion, Pop, pop, you know, pasting all this DNA and making transgenes. Okay, so let me go back to our PCR. So what is PCR? I say there are three steps, denaturation, annealing, and extension. So denaturation, 95 degrees, I showed you. Annealing, you can set it to anywhere between 55 to 65, depending on the melting point of your primers. Prim these primers, the small fragments of DNA. Now, they are specifically designed to bind to your gene of interest and amplify that gene of interest. Amplify means to make more copies of your, that particular gene. So primers are added into this, uh, the same kind of, you know, small PCR tubes. And then what do you get? You get this amplification of your DNA. So this portion, the colored portion of my DNA is what is of interest to me. Outside this, not interested. So once I do my PCR, I get it. The product is there in my PCR tube. Very small tube, has a very little amount of DNA. Hardly 30 microliters right now. Yeah. Now, once primer ready, primer will extend. They will run towards, okay? So they're running from five prime, three prime. They run towards this end. And now here, 
they, so we have forward primer, forward, and the reverse primer. They're going to run on both the strands of DNA. They run, they make copy. So they're copying this particular fragment of DNA. Now what do I get? At the end of 34, 35 cycles, here it's 30 cycles, I get a lot of copies of this DNA. Each cycle, I get, so when you start with one, one gives rise to two, two gives rise to four. Likewise, at the end of PCR, which is 34, 35 cycles, you get billions of copies of DNA. So that's what we are looking at. So that's PCR. And let me now go back to where we were. We were looking at, yeah, our plasmid. So plasmid is very important. Uh, especially with respect to your exam point of view. So what is this plasmid? Now I said, once you get a native, you know, normally existing plasmid, you cut and paste certain things, we call it as now a vector. So we call it as a cloning vector now. Now what is there in a cloning vector? A lot of things are there and we have to remember. We have origin of replication, ORI sequence. Remember I said, ORI sequence decides how fast the plasmid DNA is going to multiply. And then there is something known as selectable marker. It could be a selectable marker or a scorable marker. So what is a selectable marker? Selectable markers are markers which help in selecting in a particular media. They will only grow if you are having the gene. And here we are looking at there are two selectable markers, TET and AMP. TET is tetracycline and AMP is ampicillin. And this R means resistant, which means if you have this plasmid growing in a bacteria, the Bacteria is conferred with resistance towards these two different antibodies, ampicillin and tetracycline. So if ampicillin and tetracycline are provided to your bacteria, then the bacteria is going to ensure that this PBR322 plasmid is maintained all the time. So this plasmid, again, will have an ORI sequence. And you can see some of these restriction enzyme sites. In3 is one of the enzymes which I showed you. And uh, there are, you know, these color codes, if you look at each of these enzymes will also have, you know, let's say I have BAMH1 and I have in 3 You can see the color codes are different. Now, they, these are two different enzymes and each of these enzymes comes with a particular buffer. So we have a buffer out here and we have the enzyme out here. They're normally kept in uh, four degrees. Right now, I just have it in my hand, but this will be kept in ice all the time. Now, why do we have these kind of buffers? So buffer tango, buffer tango, why do we have it? So let's say we are using two enzymes for cutting and pasting and all, what do you do? You need to have a compatible buffer to make sure that both the enzymes are working properly. So we have color codes for enzymes, color codes for buffers, and they have to be compatible to bring about cutting, okay, digestion. So ampicillin and tetracycline, what are they? They are antibiotics, and if they're present in this PBR322, it will ensure that this bacteria is being maintained properly, given that you are providing ampicillin and tetracycline in the media. So even in this particular Petri dish, you have to provide ampicillin or tetracycline, or both of them, if you want to have this all the time multiplied. As in, within the bacteria, it is for the multiply. If you don't provide it, then there is no need for the bacteria to maintain the plasmid. So it's very important that you put ampicillin and tetracycline or both. Now, how do we decide whether we want to put you know, both or just one? Let's say I digest my PBR322 with BAMH. So now I made a cut. So if I make a cut, now I have to insert my gene of interest in over there. So my DNA has been cut. So I cut it. I have to ligate it. So once, let's say, this BAMH1 has been cut and my tetracycline gene is gone. And instead of tetracycline gene, I have put another stuff out here. So assume my finger is the gene. Now what happens? Tetracycline is gone. If tetracycline is gone, I will not put tetracycline in the media because now there's no point putting it because if something grows on tetracycline media, then it is an escape because... Tetracycline has been disrupted because I put a gene out here. So what will grow? Let's say I will only put ampicillin and selectively try to get the plasmid that is amplifying and propagated on ampicillin-containing video. So that's how I use cloning sites. So these are having a lot of these you know, restoration enzyme recognition sites. 
we call also call it as you know multiple cloning site. So MCR. So there are a lot of these restriction enzyme sites, multiple cloning sites, ECOR1, HINFI, BAMH1, PA. So these are all you know obtained from different organisms, like we said. And then there are two antibiotic resistant genes. We are having two because it's good to have one or two because we're going to clone in one of the sites. We have the other one intact, then we can selectively look for the presence of the gene of our interest in the requisite bacteria. Remember, everything is being done at a gene level, but what you're visualizing is in the bacterial level. So the bacteria has to grow in the medium. So PBR322 is a well-known plasmid. P stands for plasmid. PBR322, all this nomenclature, just like for restriction enzymes, the nomenclature, remember, I just talked about what it is. So similarly for plasmids, the nomenclature, that's a specific way in which nomenclature is given. Again, the book doesn't talk about that, so you don't have to remember any of that. So let's get going further. So here, example which is given is that of enzyme beta galactosidase. So think of another region out here in the multiple cloning site. So if you have multiple cloning site, a lot of genes are, you know, uh, recession enzyme sites are present out here. If I clone the gene over here, and let's say the gene beta galactosidase, so this green thing out here is beta gal. Beta gal, if it gets cut, it doesn't work. If that doesn't work, then I can do something like a blue white selection of my bacteria. This was antibiotic selection. This will be my scorable marker. So we have selectable marker, the pink one out here, and the green one is my scorable marker, something which I can see. So this, if once it is introduced, the plasmid is introduced into bacteria, the bacteria will become either blue or white. Okay. So if it is white, it means that my gene has disrupted the beta galactosidase. Now it is no longer blue because the gene is not working. Beta gal is not working. Beta galactosidase doesn't work. Therefore, I can use this the inactivation of beta galactosidase to selectively look for my bacteria which has recombinant DNA. So the recombinant DNA bacteria, the recombined DNA bacteria will be having the white colony. So that's how I can look at bacteria. So I showed you a petri dish wherein most of my colonies were whitish, whitish in color. So that indicates these are all white colonies which are having the gene and the beta galactosidase is all gone. So that is known as insertional inactivation. If I put the gene of my IFRIS, the normal gene, what is the normal gene? Beta gal. So this beta gal, so beta galactosidase gene gets disrupted, it gets inactivated, and therefore it doesn't function. The function of this gene is to give that blue color. So the blue color is no longer there. So there's no blue color, and the white color colonies are my recombinant colonies, the recombinant period. Okay, now agrobacterium. That's another bacteria which is present in soil. It has its own TI plasmid and it's known as tumor inducing plasmid. What does that mean? This TI plasmid is present in nature. And what as a genetic engineer have we done? We have taken this TI plasmid, put a gene of our interest. Okay, once you put a gene of your interest, I can amplify this gene and I get lots of copies of the gene. And now I can use that gene and put it into any plant of my interest to create transgenic plants. So that's how I'm going to use that TI plasmid. So tumor-inducing plasmid of agrobacteria is very important. Again, okay. these are naturally present. Once I take this, modify it. What do we call it now is? It's a vector. So instead of using TI plasmid, I will call it as a plasmid vector. Okay, now, how do I introduce it? I can use biolistics, a gene gun. I can also use microinjection, depending on what explant I'm taking to introduce the genes of my interest. So how do I do that? I have this gold or tungsten, you know, small particles. Now I take this DNA, remember my DNA is very small and this DNA, so think of this DNA, what do I do? I put my tungsten particles, precipitate my DNA. My DNA will hang on and stick onto the tungsten particles. Now those tungsten particles, I can bombard it into a, let's say there is a petri dish in which I kept my plant. Now think of a petri dish wherein I kept a plant. What will happen? Those tungsten coated DNA particles will bombard and get inside my X plant. And eventually, what do I get? I get a lot of these transgenic plants. So, that is what is biolistics. 
Microinjection is when you're taking your particular DNA and you take, let's say, a particular cell and you inject it, you know, doing it at a micro level, that is how you can insert your DNA of interest into the host cell. That's normally done for, you know, uh, let's say, some uh, fertilization kind of steps. And all. So I showed you what a DNA looks like. If I were to just, you know, take that uh, plasmid DNA from out here, spool it, I can, you know, showcase that using, yeah. So that's my plasma DNA. If I were to just, you know, shake it around, I can use any instrument to spool it up. Now, so I have a lot of these genetic materials. I can use, you know, DNA, RNA proteins, lipids, polysaccharides. All these are coming under biotechnological applications. Why? Because, for example, lysozyme. These are enzymes present in bacteria. They have n number of applications. Similarly, cellulase, what do I use it for? Obtained from plant cells. Cellulases are used to, let's say, they're acting on cellulose. So I can use this to destroy any of the plant products. Chitinase obtained from fungus. I can use this. n number of applications are there. OK. So we talked about PCR. We can skip that. Selectable and scorable markers, recombinant genes. We talked about that. Coming over to the last thing, which is the bioreactors. So bioreactors are, so once I have my bacteria growing, now I need to have, you know, a lot of product being obtained. What do I do? Since I need to multiply it, I will do it. So I will multiply my bacteria, not in small petri dishes. I will grow them in, you know, these big kind of reactors. What are these reactors? Now, these reactors are, you know, these baffles, things are rotating around. And I can actually control the pH and ensure that everything is growing in sterile environment. So once the bacterial culture and things are growing inside, I can, you know, take it out and use, you know, for the downstream processing steps to ensure that the product that I'm getting from my recombinant DNA is pure enough. And it has to go through stringent rules before it is marketed. So it's not easy to do that because uh, when it comes to a product being marketed, there are a lot of rules that have to be, you know, let's say you have to have a check mark and a checklist to ensure that it is following, you know, standards and protocols of our country. Only then it gets marketed. It's not like you can grow it and then you just market it. No, you have to ensure that it's only the end product that is the enzyme or something, which is, you know, not contaminated only then it gets marketed. So there are certain standard values and expectations to be met before it reaches the market. So we have downstream processing for that. So before it reaches, the product has to be going through some of these processes, downstream processes before it becomes a marketable product. Okay, so that was it. Uh, in summary, what did we talk about? We talked about what is biotechnology, and uh, our toolbox, our genetic engineering, and uh, we talked about enzymes. We talked about uh, both restoration enzymes and ligases, which are used to ensure that we are getting a recombinant DNA product. And uh, this recombinant DNA product, once we get it, we can you know amplify it. We can put it in a bioreactor, get lots of products. We can put it in a plant. So it all depends on your thing that you are interested in applying with as well. Okay, so that was it. Uh, I think uh, I've finished. Uh, and if there are any questions, I can take those up. Yes, children. I, I finished hope, on time. Yeah. So I hope you have received a good idea and she has shown all of that things to you. So if you have any queries, please do type that in the chat box and don't worry about the recordings. We are recording the whole session and once the whole refresher sessions are over, We'll upload it on the YouTube and we'll share those with you. Okay, there is this question. Is ethidium bromide added? Yes, it is added. And that is why you may see that fluorescence. So uh, ethidium bromide is uh, pretty carcinogenic. And whenever you're dealing with ethidium bromide, and remember that uh, we placed it on a UV lamp. So UV lamp, again, you have to ensure you are protected. And uh, normally we have a gel dock, which is just right, right next to that. If you've seen that uh, there's a big gel dog machine, yeah, that's the gel dog machine. So we just showcased to you, uh, we didn't put it in a gel dog, so we are running it somewhere there, and we just uh, showcased to you in a UV, you know, box. 
And uh, so if you want to see the mobility of your DNA in that agro gel, you have to keep it in that UV box or in the gel dog. Only then you can visually see it. And to see it, you need to have that ETBR in the gel. So the gel had ETBR. We didn't talk about that. And uh, instead of using ATBR, which is very carcinogenic, you can use nowadays uh, cyber green and uh, new kind of dyes, which will bind to your DNA. They intercalate between your DNA. You know, DNA has double strands. It intercalates between. And then you can visually see your DNA. So that's how we showcase it. So our gel did have ATBR. And uh, we took precautions to ensure that, uh, yeah, Ajisha is here and she's wearing gloves. So yeah, you have to wear gloves. So yes, I think uh, there are no further queries and I'm actually, yes. So that's already understood by the kid because they have responded also. So yes, I think there are no further queries and thank you so much children. And I'm really happy that uh, they got to know all these things practically because in schools, it's it's really difficult to show yeah. these things and they might so not have all this. Yeah. So I'll, I'll have all the recordings and we'll make it available to you. So thank you so much children for attending. And uh, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.